Rakesh Om Prakash Mehra's Delhi Six after Rang De Basanti, there's got to be a theory behind the series. Which film is this? Game. Game. That's 2011. The only correction is I actually did Kheli Hamji Jaan Se after What's Your Rashi? That ah, Rashi made. Well, fair enough. But you would still trust him. Research, my young research. <laughs> And this is, this is by Abhinav, uh, Abhinav Deo, right? Uh, who thereafter made Delhi Belly. He actually so it's made not Delhi even past film, but it's even the film after. Yeah, he actually made it before. Explain he this He had shot me. it before, yeah. Do you think you've been done in by directors? Or do you trust direct, or have you trusted directors far too much, given their past record? No, it's got nothing to do with, I've never judged them on their past record. Mm. It's, it's just, I'm a complete director's actor. Okay. Um, if I have a disagreement about how a director is seeing a particular scene, my approach is, let me try and convince them. Mm. If they're not convinced, then I have to wholeheartedly submit to what their vision is, whether I agree in it or not. Mm. Um, yeah, but... Uh, Don't they all? Is that what you're saying? You know, sometimes it's, it's hard to understand why, you know, stuff... I mean, when I see a movie like Delhi 6, Rakesh mm. was meant to make my first film, actually. We, right. we wrote a film together called Samjhota Express. Mm when we both were looking for a job and both frustrated that we weren't getting one. Um, I've known him since then. And um, I thought Deadly Six was a wonderful film. Um, yeah, but I, I, I mean, don't that know. of course is subjective, good and bad. I'm, I mean, more in terms of, because there is no way to, to quantify these things. Yeah. I'm presuming box office success is what we can go by. No, absolutely. And that's the only thing you right. should go right. by. Right. I mean, we're, we right. work in, in cinema. It's right. a commercial art. Exactly. So let's be very honest. The right. only barometer is box mm. office. Mm. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's sad. But Why do you think Delhi 6 did not reach the same level of audience reception as Rangde Basanti did? I think today, if I look back, there was no hero in Delhi 6. Mm. I think in storytelling, it's very important to have a hero, a protagonist and an antagonist. Mm. There were, I think, too many protagonists, so we didn't know who to get behind. Mm. Um, I mean, like we were discussing Bunty or Bubbly. Right. There's this beautiful scene in Bunty or Bubbly where uh, they're sitting by a brook and suddenly Bubbly starts crying and Bunty asks her, why are you crying? And she turns around and very innocently says that I'm missing my home. And mm. they go and actually they call their parents and mm. she calls and speaks to her parents and mm. says, I'm okay. And then she turns to him and says, now your turn. And mm. he says, no, nobody is missing me or thinking of me at home. And you cut to a shot of, of Bunty's very critical father, um, which was played by Mr. Raj Babar, sitting under a contraption that Bunty had invented a shower mm. and missing his son. At that point in time, what happens is suddenly your heart goes out to them. And you're like, oh, I want these kids to do well. Right. You know, you know I'm, I'm get behind them. Right. You emotionally you invest them, in them. Right. You root for them. I feel maybe in Delhi 6, there were too many people to root for. So who do you root for? Mm. Um, I think that could have gone wrong with Delhi 6. What about game? Like Buman Irani as Thai Prime Minister? Yeah. <laughs> what are you saying? Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> Why? They have a lot of Indian expats in... What went wrong with game? Hmm. I'm just remembering the film. I guess that's what went wrong. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> uh, game went through a lot of casting changes also. And um, I think we started laying too much emphasis. It was essentially a revenge story. Mm. It was the revenge of my character that he was taking for the murder of the love of his life, which mm. was played by Sarah. From that, it became a murder mystery to then, I think we just kind of lost the focus of the film. Mm. Had it remained just the story of a lover taking revenge for the murder of his mm. beloved, I think it would have had a lot more focus. Somewhere, I think we kind of diluted the focus. Then there was the character of the, you know, the Interpol agent played by Kangana, right. then the other characters and how they linked up. So I think somewhere we kind of compromised the soul of the film. Right. You know, the reason why I'm asking these questions, Abhishek, is because there's something that you said which you know, which was part of your self-introspection is about how you've got to be selfish. And while you've been extremely loyal throughout in your career, being selfish is very important because that's how people become successful. Yep. Was it in respect to certain career choices you made? Because a lot of them could have come from the fact 
that those were your friends and yeah. all your friends are from the film industry. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think one of the things I learned from the younger generation, uh, younger generation, I mean like the 15 to 25 year olds, mm. is there's an immense sense of professionalism mm. and confidence in what they do. It doesn't matter who's standing in front of them. I grew up in a generation, and because maybe I'm from the film industry, mm. um, there's this whole element of respect, and there's this whole Senior, element. Senior, junior. Se yeah, all that. They, they, they're okay with that, but once the camera comes on, all bets are off. Mm. They're going to come at you in, in front of the camera, right. in the scene, and, and give it their whole. Mm. Whereas I know in the past, out of respect, you've, you, know, you know, no, no, okay, you want facing, take facing. Oh, you know, uh, I used to do that kind of stuff. Mm. Somewhere, as an actor, or in any profession, and I mean this in the best possible way, mm. I, I don't mean this negatively, be selfish. Be selfish for yourself, for your craft, for your own people. In that sense, be selfish because you, you need to be a bit selfish to be able to give your best. If you're not convinced in your own head that you're not going to be able to give your best, you're not going to give your best right. there in turn. You're, not, you're doing injustice to the venture. Mm. There's absolutely nothing wrong. I actually felt previously that if I disagreed with somebody, I, I wouldn't tell them. Mm. No, no, I, I don't want to be that, that kind of guy. I don't want to um, come across as arrogant. I don't, wanna, I don't want to give people an opportunity to say, oh, you know, he's just flexing his muscles, so to speak. Mm. Or on some level, it was uncool to just disagree. Mm. That was a big problem. Oh, were you overcompensating for being a bachan? I, I guess so. Right. Uh, I'm sure... Not I'm sure, I mean, that was one of the right. reasons. I, d I never wanted anybody to think that, oh, he's Mr. and Mrs. Bachchan's son, so he's saying this, so we're listening to him, because right. I never wanted that. I was very conscious of that, from my behavior to everything. Um, I don't think I'd ever compromise my parents and their dignity even today. Mm. But today, if I disagreed with something, I w I've understood how to put my point across in a better way, instead of, it was, for me, it was like, okay, if they're not going to get it, I'm just... Yeah, whatever, mm -hmm. man, let's just do it. But sometimes, you know, and I learned this from Amir, mm. he told me that disagreement is very important on a film set because it leads to an even greater outcome. Mm. So he says, I have no problem if people disagree with me. I'm willing to discuss it with them, debate it with them, because I am convinced that through that debate, you're going to arrive at a better answer. That everyone's happy with. Absolutely. Right. Because, you know, the point of selfishness, and here I'm going to tap into what I believe is a rather undertapped aspect of your personality. You're an extremely, you're a thinking man, um, which obviously one would not realize from Household 3, but, but one does from a lot of your in-depth interviews that I've, that I've watched. And you spent two years in sport. You pretty much devoted it to your sports company with Kabaddi, with, with football, of course. Selfishness is really intrinsic to sport. And you said, and you've spoken about how sport is the closest metaphor for life. Because all its ups and downs you can see in those 30 minutes flat or whatever is the duration for a game. Do you derive a lot from sports people? Do you have like favorite sports people, what they've said? Yep. Yeah. Immensely. Um, I, I used, to, I've been a sportsman when I was in school and then in college. I still play sports and I really think sports teaches you so much about life. It prepares you for the, you know, for the world out there. If it's a team sport, it teaches you about teamwork. It teaches you about sportsman spirit. More importantly, it teaches you how to fight back as a team. It mm. teaches you how to never give up. If it's a solo sport, same thing's there. So I think there are a lot of wonderful metaphors in life that you can draw with sport as well. And there are wonderful sportsmen out there that I've, that I've idolized mm. um, and just um, been so inspired by their journey and how they've gone about achieving what they achieved. And one thing mm. which is um, that I really learned and um, from them is in their mind, they're convinced that they're the best at what they do. Mm. And that comes across brash, you know? When you have, like, I'm, I, my first love in sports is basketball, right? I used to be a basketball player. And one of my favorite, pl anybody play basketball here? Okay, four people, five, okay, no problem. So there's this one basketball player that I used to love called Shaquille O'Neal, mm. okay? He eventually, he started playing for the Orlando Magic, went on to play for the Lakers and the Celtics and Miami, Cleveland. And he, he, you know, he was this monster of a basketball player. And even I followed him from when he was in college, and he was just the next big thing. And he's goes goes down till date as one of the greatest basketball players ever. And 
as, as growing up as kids, you idolized him. And the first time I saw an interview of his, mm. I was like, oh my God, this guy's really arrogant. Because mm. his first statement was, I'm the greatest. Mm. At that point, I'm like, no, that's not cool, man. No, just be humble, mm. you know. Today, I realized that he needed to say that to himself to achieve what he achieved. Because if you're not convinced that mm. you're the best person for this job, you're not going to be able to give your best and do your best. So that element of self-belief, mm. bordering on, on, on megalomania almost, right. but it's important to achieve the great things. You know, I don't think any of, you know, the great leaders of past somewhere in their mind felt that, no, no, I'm, I'm happy over here. I mean, you mm. want to go out there and conquer, you know. When Alexander came and conquered half the world is because he believed he was destined to do so and that he could do so. So that confidence is very important. It's just that shift from, you can't be arrogant about it, but you have to have that belief. Mm. That's very important. So those, um, those kind of things really taught me a lot from sport and it did help me a lot to just channelize what I needed to do. But, uh, yeah. Right, yeah. right. So is that the version 2.0 we're talking about? Part of it, yeah. Right. Part of it. I can't wait to do Household 5 though. No, 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 it's, it's just really pissing you off. <laughs> no, it's not. Yeah. No, it's not. I'm going to convert you. You know what? I actually liked uh, Household 3. But I there you go. Yeah, I'm saying. It's a different I'm kind of so. cinema. It's a different you kind know? of film, yes. Yeah, you see, we're not promising you, uh, you know, Godard or anything like that. Absolutely. But come there, be entertained, laugh for three hours, go away. And, you know, in, in, in our life and times today, which are so demanding and tough, mm. you know, those three hours of just going out there and just having unabashed fun is, I think, is good. Right. No, I'm going to go back to the director's part. Abhishek, because right before this, we had a session with Rohit Shetty. Yeah. And, you know, one of the things that he mentioned is that, like, for instance, in the case of how Singham got made, uh, Singham got written at 12 o'clock, or got narrated at 12 o'clock to Ajay, uh, finished at 2.30 a.m., and 7, he was on the set, and he was doing it, yeah. because that's the level of confidence he reposed on his director. Uh, and he says that's the only way, way you survive for that long. That's how, say, and like say he's only worked with Shah Rukh Khan outside of, uh, I mean so far for the movie that I released and with you of course. Uh, yes, 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 very much, yeah, very much. Two films. Um, so does the actor-director combination then become a very, very important element uh, for an actor's career? A absolutely. Um, but I think that's so in, in, um, in any field. Mm. I mean, even in your field, your relationship with your editor mm. is of paramount importance because the editor has to have a vision for what they want for the newspaper. Mm. They need to try to convey that to you, but they also need to be able to balance off what you as a journalist can provide and they don't want to compromise your vision because there's a unique perspective. So a relationship you might have with your publisher or your editor mm. is similar to an actor and, and their director and, that c and it's a collaborative exercise, right, mm. filmmaking. So obviously you, you've traditionally seen wonderful actor-director combinations right. survive for a long time. And I think that's very important. I mean, not just actor-director, even actresses and their directors have you know, had some wonderful collaborations. Right. And that's important because there is a level of trust. You also know that this guy's gonna take care of me or this lady's gonna take mm. care of me. I understand their vision, I know what they're talking about. They don't need to spend extra time to get out the performance that they need because I know instinctively what they want. Mm. Which have been your favorite uh, directors in terms of a combination? A lot of them. I mean, to start off with J.P. Saab. Right. Because uh, he introduced me to the world of cinema. Mm. A lot of my education about acting and cinema was through him. Mm. Um, but with him, it was, I mean, I used to just submit. I mm. mean, it was like a holiday for me. I mm. knew J.P. Saab would just take care of me. And he treats mm. his actors like his children. Mm. So J.P. Saab, of course. Um, you know, I really enjoyed working a lot with, with Mani, mm. uh, with Ramu. Mm. Um, I really enjoyed working a lot with, uh, with Karan. Mm. When I did, uh, but that was more on a personal Can. level. Yeah, we did Kabi Al Vidana with right. him. Um, I have really enjoyed working with Anurag, actually. Mm. Um, another director that blew me away was Ashutosh. Mm. Um, Ashutosh was possibly the first time I worked with a director who had been an actor. Mm. So I learned so much from him about approaching a scene from an acting perspective. So mm. his direction was always from an acting perspective. Mm. So I really enjoyed that. Um, but, but, you know, I've learned so much from different, different directors. You know, like right. Rakesh has a very unique approach to the way he works. 
Tarun uh, Mansukhani mm. had a completely different approach. But you know, um, it's 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 nice when you forge. But for me, I've never managed to work, thankfully, with a director that I just didn't like. Really? Yeah. It's never happened. In never works? happened. I mean, I've never been on a film set where, be it a co-star or a, or a director, I'm like, yeah, really not interested in seeing your face today. Mm. But just been a professional. I I can't work like that. For me, it's very important that everybody's a buddy on like, set. Does, does it really help to belong to the film industry then? Or something like that? For instance, I was, I was, there's this episode I was reading about when you were shooting for Kabhi Alvidan Rakana. And it's an emotional scene. And you were supposed to tell Rani's character that your father is no more. Yeah. And you had a picture of your father that you were supposed to look at. And then you told her. And you just broke down. And then Karan Johar broke down. And then Ayan Mukherjee broke down. And then Aarti Shetty broke down. The whole set was crying. I mean, that's, that's a scene from a Karan Johar film. It, I mean, that kind of bonding, I don't think we'll ever get in, a, in my job, no way. In my office, nobody's going to cry like that for anything. I think the function of what you do is slightly different. Mm. Um, We're unemotional people, is that what you say? No. Okay. The purpose is different, sure. right? Um, Actually, th yeah, this thing did happen. It was a, a very uncomfortable moment. Yeah, take us for that moment. Yeah, there's a scene. Um, Karan Johar and I made a film in 2006 called Kabhi Alvida Na uh, in which I played a character called, called Rishi. And he's married to Maya. And they're childhood friends. And she's not in love with him, but he's in love with her. And it's a beautiful relationship. And they, you know, she uh, has an affair with Shah Rukh And they, they divorce and separate. And near the end of the film, um, there's a beautiful song, which is Kabhi Al Vidana Kena. It finishes where you see Rani after two, three years. She's all alone. She's not with Shah Rukh. And Rishi comes to see her. And he comes to tell her that, um, and he's meeting after they're divorced. And he says that I just came to tell you that um, I'm getting married. I found somebody that I really love. And she's very happy for him. And she says he asks her to be his best man or woman, mm -hmm. so to speak. And he says, look, uh, Maya, at the end of the day, I've realized I have no one else. You've been my best friend since I was a child. Right. I had one more person, which was my dad, but mm. he passed away. And um, she's not aware of this. And um, my father in the film treats Rani like his daughter, because they had been mm. childhood friends. Mm. And he takes out a photograph and he says he would have wanted you to have this. And it's a photograph of my father. Um, actors also, you know, they, you lock up a lot of emotions, because that's used a lot in your craft. Right. And I didn't want to rehearse that scene mm. uh, for some weird reason. I was just at that point thinking, okay, let me just go perform it. And I performed the scene and I remember um, he said, yeah, you know, he passed away. And I pulled out this photograph and that's when the reality actually hits you. And you know, the lines get blurred. And I just remember thinking to myself that I'm talking about my father passing away. And that photograph was actually of my, my you know, mm. my dad played my father's character in that. Mm. And it just kind of got to me. And I remember f we finished the scene. I just went to the side, and I, you know, I think the emotion of the scene got the better of me, and I just broke down. And Karan noticed this, mm. um, and he came and he just hugged me, and he broke down because he was also dealing with the loss of Yashankal at that right. point of time. Yashankal had just passed away under a year ago, mm. and Karan had written that scene, keeping these emotions in mind. Everybody on that set, from Anil Mehta, the DOP, to Ayan Mukherjee, who was a um, an assistant on the film, Arti was, they were, all, everybody knew the, the emotion of the scene. I think everybody was, ha had their own interpretation right. of that scene. So it just, you know, that happens, that's happened once or twice with me. Oh yeah? It's yeah. happened again? It happened, yeah, it happened in Marmarjia as well. Really? Yeah. What was that? Uh, so it's not an industry thing. I sure. mean, Anurag is not, not somebody who was born, he was born in Banaras. Right. So, um. <laughs> so, so it's 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 just when you know when you're on a film set, there is a bond, you know, uh, a bond between an actor and a director is sacred, because in a sense, an actor tells the director, "Look, here's my soul. Please take care of it, mm. because I'm very fragile." That's why when when we talked about collaborations, mm. they go a long way because there is that implicit faith. You're literally putting your life in somebody's hands. Mm. Uh, in a Rohit Shetty film, you truly are putting your life in somebody's <laughs> hands. You know, um, so it's it's that it's you know, actors somewhere are very fragile beings, and they they tell the director, "Look, here it is. Be nice. Take care. Don't hurt me, because mm. you have the tools to really take me to a dark place. Mm. If you take me to the dark place, be that light that'll bring me out." 
Mm. Um, so that happens, and that's you know, it's 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 very often that when there's an emotional scene, an actor will be on the side preparing, and the unit is very aware of the emotion of the scene, and the unit almost automatically adopts that mood. If it's a comic scene, everybody's having fun, they're mm -hmm. fooling around. If it's an emotional scene, you see the set is very quiet and you know people are whispering when they don't need to be, but they respect the fact that something very fragile is happening, so let's be nice about that. So that's what happened during, um, yeah, it was... A what was the scene, what happened in yeah. Manmarzia? It was actually during a, a, a shot that we did of a song called Halla, mm. where Robbie, my character, is finally breaks down and starts getting destroyed about the fact that uh, he's caught his wife mm. um, with Vicky, and he gets he gets a, he gets drunk and he's and he just goes to a club right. and starts dancing. It's a fabulous scene. So that was actually one one long shot, mm. and um, Anurag had wanted me to do that on my first day, mm. <laughs> and, I, and I said no. There's also actors have this thing that there's this one scene that they're always petrified of. And they just keep putting off. You know, they keep running. This was that one thing because mm. I knew what it was going to take. It was also the first time that you see Robbie react. He's not a reactive right. person. He just right. absorbs, absorbs. Yeah. And Anurag's thing was, you know, just he takes it and takes it and takes it. And now it's just too much. Bursts. And yeah, you know, you have to erupt. So I was running away from it. So this was about halfway through the schedule. We actually did it one night. And... Um, he had been just literally chabbing me to do the scene for like 15, 20 days. And that night also my football team was playing the semi-finals and we qualified for the final. So I was really happy. And then we went and did the scene and Anurag had been, so it was a mixture of everything. Right. And again, you just, you know, a lot of times you just lose yourself in what you're doing. You see this very often with dancers, mm. you know, especially people who do a lot of stage performance and dancing. You see that a dancer has just lost themselves in that right. moment. And you, they just achieve a certain it's kind of dervishes yeah, right? yeah it's like that you yeah. know um and you you just i mean you just get sucked into that moment and they had music playing they were playing the song and you know he had built and we we're just doing it and that scene finished and he said i want i said at the end of it i'm going to be so tired of just having taken out that aggression that i just want to crumble down and that's and that's it he said yeah yeah great and anurag in his typical self never cuts the shot Mm. And now, I mean, previously when we used to work on film, you had four minutes. Right. You know, one, one can was four minutes. Now with the cards, they go on for 10, 15 minutes. Mm. And so Halla is about a three and a half, four minute song and the entire thing, and he didn't cut. So throughout, I was just giving it all and just taking it out. And it's almost like a cathartic moment for him. And, and, and I just remember collapsing and Anurag didn't cut it. And the music went off and everybody just froze like I said, everybody's very aware mm -hmm. of what's going on. Mm. And I just lost the plot after that. I just couldn't control myself. I think, you know, whatever you've just been working up, it just comes out. And on some level for me, it was also cathartic about the last two years of what all I'd gone through. Right. Maybe all of that came into, I don't know. And the next thing I just remember is Anurag had just come and he's howling and he was hugging wow. me. And then two, three other people started crying. And then I went to the video monitor to see it and Kanika, the writer, and all these people there. So... It's it's it happens quite often, you know. Um, so yeah, it's not an industry thing. It's yeah. no, it's not. I'm sure. I'm sure. Yeah. But but as an actor, uh, Abhishek, uh, I mean, you had perhaps the world's greatest in your house. 